Here's a question that came out of the ancient church period towards the end of it. I'll just read it to you. What were some of the issues that caused the Ethiopian and Coptic church to break off after Chalcedon? So just to refresh your memory, the Coptic and Ethiopian branch of the church broke off from the Catholic church in the early 500s after the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. There's a theological explanation and there's a political explanation. The political one's a little easier, so I'll start there. At this point in world history, there were four major churches, Rome, Antioch, Constantinople, and Alexandria, and all four of those were in competition with one another. Ultimately, some of that political competition led the churches in kind of this Middle East area, Egypt and Ethiopia and Syria, to split off on their own. Now for the theological explanation, which is quite a bit more complex. If you'd like to go into greater depth, I would just point you again to the book Church History in Plain Language by Bruce Shelley. This is chapter 11. He'll walk you through a series of interpretations that the church outlawed by a, a series of different leaders of some of these churches. So you had a guy named Apollinarius, you had a guy named Nestorius, and then finally you had a guy named Eutyches. I'm not positive on how to pronounce his name, but the key about Eutyches is that he said that in Jesus you had one nature. So the divine and the human and were perfectly blended into one new nature, the church ended up saying, no, there are two natures that are not confused, not blended in Jesus. There's both the divine and the human. That was codified at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, but a group of churches said, no, they're not gonna hold to that. That's where the Coptic or Ethiopian church breaks off. And they're part of a movement, uh, again, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this, but monophytism, meaning one nature in Jesus. So the thing that you unites these churches, even though they're kind of, they're divided nationally into like the Coptics in Egypt, the Ethiopic church in Ethiopia, they all share this view that in Jesus, there was only one nature, a mixture of divine and human. The Creed of Chalcedon says, no, there's actually two distinct natures. Ultimately, it's getting to where we're kind of splitting hairs. It's really hard to wrap our minds around it. So we would still call them believers. They're still Christians. We just differ in the language that we use to try to describe Jesus in the incarnation. The next question looks at the monasteries that were around in the Middle Ages. So let me read this question to you. How would you compare the best of the medieval monastery to the contemporary Protestant seminary? Are there virtues in the medieval model of the monastery that have been lost in the contemporary Western church? What role, if any, does the contemporary seminary play in reclaiming those lost virtues? That's a challenging question because it's, it's really complex. The monasteries of the medieval ages existed in a world that, that isn't our world anymore. So if you think about the worldview of the Middle Ages, if you think about how um, nations worked, how society worked, how culture worked, it's radically different than the world that you and I find ourselves in today. So let's step back for a moment and think about what at its essence was going on in monasteries in the Middle Ages. I, I think that the first and foremost thing that you see in those monasteries is a desire of men and women to practice their faith in an authentic way. That's not, it's not secularized. It's not blended into just the rest of the world around them. They wanted to be distinct. They wanted to pursue the Lord wholeheartedly. I think that there is a need for that. Uh, having been at a seminary for a number of years, gotten my THM, I can say that a seminary at its essence um, in the world today is primarily a, a place of learning. It's an educational institution. Just going to seminary is not going to make you fully devoted to God. It's, it's in a lot of ways, it, it's gonna um, make it more challenging during that season of your life to wholly devote yourself to God because you're having to read so many books and write so many papers and work so hard. And so it, in some ways it can be distracting from that just simple devotion to God that we see in the medieval monasteries. Um, however, seminary can have some of the good effects that the monasteries from medieval ages did. It, it, can, it can challenge us to go deeper in our faith, and, and you see the monks do that. You see nuns do that. They're going deeper in their faith. They're trying to understand 
God better and in so doing they're being prepared for future leadership in the church. We talked about that, how a lot of the leaders in kind of the middle era of the middle ages, the high middle ages as we call them, came out of the monasteries because they had gone deeper in their in their faith and their commitment to God, their willingness to follow him. So seminaries at their best can can prepare leaders for the church in the future. But I think that with with seminaries today compared to monasteries in, in the Middle Ages, um, your seminary's experience is what you make of it. In the Middle Ages, when a monk showed up at the door, or I guess it would be somebody who wanted to be a monk to the door of a monastery, uh, it was a whole life commitment. If you're going to live there, you're going to do everything the abbot tells you. That is going to be your entire existence is participating in the life of that monastery. That's not true in a seminary. In the seminary, you're signing up to take classes. Um, your devotion to God is not something the seminary tries to control. Um, they're simply trying to educate you. And so your seminary experience is what you make of it, and it can either lead you into greater devotion to God um, or, uh, or not. It's all about what you make of it. Next question is about the Inquisition. Wasn't the Spanish Inquisition a political move to assert that the Christians were in control again after pushing out Muslim invaders? Uh, let's talk about first this word inquisition. So inquisition is a, a broader term than Spanish inquisition. Inquisition was a tool that the Roman Catholic Church used to try to enforce Roman Catholic orthodoxy. Uh, it, it was used in different nations and had uh, different particulars, uh, different uh, force in different places. The Spanish Inquisition is one of those, and in some ways kind of the most notorious. Yes, in Spain, the Inquisition there started uh, particularly after the Spanish uh, retook the nation from uh, Muslims who had controlled it for a long time. It was an attempt to push out all Muslim influence and enforce Roman Catholicism. But as the Protestant Reformation grew throughout Europe, it was repurposed to try to stamp out Protestantism as it spread out. Basically, you can think of the Inquisition simply as a, uh, a legal tool, because usually it, we think of it often through the grid of like imprisonment and torture. Sometimes that happened, but really it was just a court where they could use uh, the legal process to try to find out who was a heretic and, and punish them if, if they were found. So basically a Roman Catholic tool to enforce orthodoxy. Um, it's easy to look down at Roman Catholicism because of the Inquisition. We have to remember that even though the, the word Inquisition refers to the Roman Catholic tool, Protestants use similar tools, particularly the magisterial Protestants that combine church and state. So you have Calvin in Geneva, for example, when he discovered uh, heretical teachers, he had them executed because that was just the normal assumption in the world at that time is that if you deviated from um, the religion of whoever controlled the territory that you lived in, that you should come under a legal penalty from the state and that could be as severe as torture or execution. <laughs> 